in addition to people using humanitarian language to speak beyond it, people's relationships to UNRWA often foreground what they see as a denial of rights within the humanitarian arena, right? So this is what I was talking about before, people saying, we have rights that have been granted to us, but that aren't being actualized, right? And so people argue that the humanitarian obligations of the international community to Palestinians are not being adequately met. And I think that this is a debate that my guess is everyone is familiar with and probably has participated in, right? What are the consequences of changes in UNRWA action and policy? What are the, what are the implications of it for the political future um, of Palestinians, but also for the international community's recognition of its responsibility? Um, I think maybe I will skip through this, per this particular section. We can talk about it more, but I think it, it'll, it'll be familiar to you the ways in which people make claims of UNRWA for UNRWA services in political terms. And I guess that's, that's sort of the important thing to, to keep in mind as we think about policy in this context, that making claims of UNRWA is not just making a claim for, for charity, for, for need, but a claim of rights. Yeah. So what I want to turn to then is trying to think about this sort of the existential questions, right? The, po the kind of politics of living over the long term and how it shapes life experience. And I want to do this by looking at basically you know, one, one of the life histories, oral histories that I did. So looking through one person's life, her family's life, to, to consider some of what this, this politics of living, this existential condition might be. And um, this is the story that, of Fedouz, who was born in Gaza camp in 1969. And she narrated her life to me basically through a humanitarian lens, right? Each sort of state, life stage from childhood to adulthood talked about in relation to changing humanitarian practices. Not that this was the only thing in her life, but, uh, but an important part of it. And her story reflects an intimate calculus of life, right? An intimate sort of the close in making decisions about values and making claims. It shows how humanitarian effects are often worked out in relations between parents and children, husband and wife, with neighbors. And it is frequently in these daily spaces that values, right? The vocabulary of national politics, ideas about community, who fits where, what it is and will be in the future to be Palestinian get worked out. Right? Now, Feruz was born at home and told me how much her mother hoped that the tents they lived in for the first years would be replaced by more permanent structures before her birth. And she described how her mother was, you know, really hoped that they would move from tents to, to barracks um, before she was born, and that did happen. Then as a young child, she went to a church-sponsored nursery school where UNRWA distributed milk and food to the children each day, responding to what at the time was widespread malnourishment in the camp. The next thing that she recalled to me was receiving aid packages, bougage, filled with foreign clothing. Right? And she described how excited they were to have leather shoes in contrast to the plastic shoes they'd been wearing before, but also indicated the dissonance that sometimes went along with getting clothes designed for different styles and sensibilities. Her mother, while accepting the clothes, was a bit wary about them. She used to say, we don't know what sort of diseases these foreigners had, so she boiled them. She also often felt it necessary to rework the clothes. My mother has taste. For example, if she found a dress revealing or something, she would take it to the tailor to fix it. She would add pieces because she would be embarrassed to wear it. Sometimes when the design was too much, we would laugh. She would tear it up and make dust, cloth for dusting. But also the colors. What would she say? Eeh, these foreigners don't wear anything but this flashy yellow. They're yellow themselves. <laughs> now, each of these responses, these are sm sort of small scale, right, in the moment responses, but they assert the value of Palestinian taste and life, right? In this case, not expressed as a claim for a specific outcome, right? She's not asking for something specific, but as an existential fact, right? We, we need something, but this doesn't mean that we don't have our own values, our own understanding, our, our own desires, right? This continues even in a moment of need. Neither the condition of need nor the aid relationship dissolve the sense of value attached to being Palestinian. Now making do with other people's cast offs, with limited resources, of course is characteristic of the refugee experience and it loomed large in Feruz's account. So again, she, remembering that she was born 
in a moment, you know, after a new, relatively new displacement. She described how there was no piped water in the camp and everyone had to bring water from central faucets. She remembered the system that her mother imposed to make sure that the family had enough water. It was forbidden to eat before filling up two buckets of water first in exchange for the food. This way she would guarantee she has the water. And if you don't bring water, you stay without food until you bring it. This was because of the harshness of life. It was not that mom was tough, she needed the water because she had kids. And I think the stories that she tells highlight the ways that people take action with humanitarian artifacts, not just to make claims, but to make a life, a family, and a community. And, and Fedor's mother also told me lots of stories about negotiating with UNRWA workers to get particular supplies, right, to, to change the, the, the circumstances in their houses and things. And she saw these struggles as being about survival, but as always more than that, right, as claims for resources were community claims. Now, reflecting on her adult life, her marriage and family, Fedor's described her connection to the space of the camp. She and her family had lived for seven years in Amen because her husband was working there, and they moved back to the camp when his father got sick. And she described to me the disconnect that she felt with her neighbors in Amen because they hadn't shared her particular life experiences. As she put it, sometimes I would say something to my neighbors when I invited them over for coffee. I wanted to say something in particular, and I felt that these women are not going to understand me. They're not going to understand what I want to say. Now, the women that she was talking about were also Palestinian, right? So they're, they're, they're not totally distant from her community, but not camp <laughs> residents with the same intimate relationship, daily relationship with humanitarian work. Right? For Feru, is the experience of living what she called the refugee life, right? Which means living with the infrastructure of the camp, the services of the camp, not only shaped her sense of self, it shaped where she felt at home in the world. Um, so as much as she wants things to change, right, she wants a political resolution for Palestinian refugees, a civil rights transformation for ex-Gazans, she is most at ease in the social network of the camp. But her children, she told me, had a different experience. Right? She's at ease in the camp, but she sees them as rejecting the camp life. As she told me, they reject that they should keep feeling that they should live in a camp as if they were third, fourth, or fifth degree human beings. They want to feel different. Many times they would come back and say, change this house for us. Enough with the Zinko. Enough with I don't know what. They are fed up. We were not fed up like that, although our situation was more difficult. But we did not complain. So while Feroz felt somewhat out of place in Amen, for her children, Amen had provided an opportunity to live a less marked life. Right? So they, weren't, they didn't stand out in the same way. My son says our life in Amen was better. At least no one knows we're Gazans. No one knows we're from the Gaza camp. They deal with us as though we were like them, people. You don't feel any difference at all. When do you feel discrimination? When you confront government institutions. But the social life, they feel like they live in a house, like the houses where other people live. So they say no, take us back to Amen. I don't know how much they can bear because I can see until now that they cannot take the life of refugees. Now, Fedor's worries about her children. Of course, she wants them to be happy and to have opportunity. But she also worries about them politically, right? She's worried about what sorts of Palestinians they will be. And she's concerned about what relation they and others of their generation, which is your generation, will have to Palestine. She sees a difference between her two oldest boys. Of the eldest, she said to me, if he gets full rights in Jordan, I am sure that he will forget everything called Palestine. But my second, if he gets all the rights in this country, he will still demand Palestine. And she sort of wondered, you know, she's saying, I've raised them the same way, but they have different experiences. Now, her account of differences in her family, generational and otherwise, reflects the patterns I found talking to multiple generations in the camp. And Feroz thought about her own life in relation to key features of the humanitarian apparatus and to changes in it. She identified most strongly with others who were as fully inside this apparatus as herself. But her children, on the other hand, saw Amen as an opportunity to live apart from this system, right? to be in some sense free from its categories. And as I said before, it's important, I think, to remember that what it means to be sort of inside humanitarianism is different for Feruz's children than it is for her. Right? She grew up in a system where there was an, an expansive humanitarian apparatus, rations, clothes, all sorts of things being provided. But the refugee life that her children experience is marked more by distinction than by assistance. Right? They don't get as much aid anymore, but they are marked as different by, by this living. 
But even if they lived outside the camp, as they grow into adulthood and have to confront their categorical location more directly, they would likely discover that they too are defined by where they fit, in Jordan, right, as ex-Gazans, in the Palestinian community, and in the humanitarian apparatus. So just to sort of bring it to a conclusion, just as I started by saying that humanitarianism is multiple things at the same time, so too is the politics of life and the politics of living in the humanitarian condition. So humanitarian categories provide people with a ground from which to act and to make claims. Humanitarian language can then shape these claims. And then if humanitarianism becomes a space for claim making, its changing practices also structure people's lives and their relations with each other. It's a key way that people define themselves and their community and their relationships with other Palestinians. So people, even as a relationship to an extensive humanitarian system is one of the central things that we could say is shared by Palestinians across the different places, spaces of displacement, people are very differently involved with it, right? To have different relationships to it. And it has changed over time. So everything the Palestinians have experienced since 1948 not only binds people together, it keeps them together, but also differentiates and sometimes distances them from each other. So each of these lines of distinction, right, living inside a camp, living outside a camp, having citizenship, not having citizenship, having access to certain services, not. Each of these lines of distinction shapes the contours of Palestinian community and politics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.